on the agenda is a presentation and discussion of the Imagine 2050 60% draft plan, which is a pretty exciting, auspicious day to get to this point. We've been talking about being at this point, and it's going to become now more public. Uh, but first, we get to see it. Uh, and if, without objection, I will assume that agenda is approved. And, uh, but first, we have minutes from the Committee of the Whole meeting on May 1st. Are there any additions, edits, corrections? And if not, a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Move approval. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Those council meeting minutes on May 1st are approved. So, our information, our one information item in and the big one, <laughs> our executive director of community problems, Lisa Barajas. Thank Welcome, you, Mr. Lisa. Chair. Thank you, council members. Lisa Barajas, executive director of community development division. I'm just kicking off this conversation today. Um, uh, and a pretty big milestone for our teams. So you won't see the full 60% draft in front of you today. We do have some upcoming meetings for CDC, where, our, where CDC members will be reviewing 60% drafts. But by the end of this month, those uh, drafts will be ready and posted in early June for continued informal engagement. Um, and to get us there, I want to start. Come on. Um. Ta -da. So for today, we'll have updates from each of our policy areas. You've heard at Committee of the Whole from all of them along the way, some of them very recently, um, more recently than others. So it will be very um, light updates as far as content, but really wanted to bring up to speed on the state of where each of these policy areas are. Then we'll talk about our consolidated timeline for adoption because there's a lot of official activity across the council and all of our various advisory committees, uh, technical groups, and our standing committees in order to even get us to releasing the public comment draft in August and then more um, official action after that that we'll review and then we'll have uh, time for discussion. So um, the teams have all been working really hard. Uh, we have representatives from each of our teams here today, but just know while there's five folks I think presenting today, there are probably 50 plus folks who are contributing to writing, reviewing, editing, and analyzing, and integrating with one another across our work. And that work continues even at the 60% stage where you'll see that there are things that we know we have to update this, or we know we have to continue to work on this stuff together and ensure that we continue to have that integration and alignment across all of our plans in order to more effectively advance the regional goals that are, uh, that are uh, espoused in this plan. So with that, I am going to turn it over to staff and see if we can make this work. And we'll start with land use policy. And if I have to, I'll stay here if that doesn't work. Hi, council members. I'm Angela Torres, the senior manager of local planning assistance. I've been in front of you several times. In fact, most recently at your April 17th Committee of the Whole uh, meeting, where we went through all of the land use objectives, policies, and actions. Uh, so that was just 20 business days, so I hope that you're not expecting, you know, a, an entirely different approach or plan uh, since then. But you will see on the schedule that I, I posted um, that we have been very, very busy. Uh, so the darker green on the slide just indicates external stakeholder uh, groups. The lighter green includes council member engagement. Uh, and this doesn't include the American Indian Advisory Council, which has had also two meetings during this time, but that those conversations don't solely focus on land use, while the rest of those conversations were. Um, so we've used every minute of that time. 
Um, we concluded uh, in the last month the land use uh, local government focus group, which had five total meetings, uh, and the community leaders technical advisory group, which had four meetings. The community leaders group, just as a reminder, is made up of was made up of members of the Young Leaders Collaborative represent, representatives, the Regional Policy Collaborative that was in front of you at the Committee of the Whole earlier uh, this year, um, as well as the like we had uh, many one-off uh, engagements, focused conversations is what we called them, with different community organizations, and that was the makeup of the uh, Community Leaders Technical Advisory Group. So we'd like to circle back at the end to make sure, did we hear you right? Is your information presented in a way that you see it, that you, you connect with it? Um, in addition to that, the Land Use Advisory Committee met, twi met twice more. Uh, they're a small but mighty group of nine uh, dedicated, mostly local elected officials. It's a smaller group than uh, normal. We're working on recruitment and, and uh, restocking, restocking. <laughs> Rebuilding <laughs> membership in that group. Sorry about that. Um, um, but they added two special meetings this year just so that they could continue to co contribute and collaborate on the land use policy uh, conversations. Uh, we have another meeting tomorrow, as a matter of fact, with them. Uh, we met with the Regional Development Guide Council Member Working Group twice, uh, including just this morning. Uh, it was a great conversation. And we'll meet with the CDC on Monday to walk through the 60% draft plan, uh, as Lisa mentioned. So the land use policy development in Imagine 2050 took a people-centered approach, really intentionally elevating the voices of underrepresented communities, considering their feedback in equal measure and considering the individual experiences in the built form. So that is a different approach than in Thrive, but one that we were excited to hear council members directing us to do, and so we were happy to do that. Um, there were, um, there's eight objectives, and you won't see eight listed here, because uh, I combined a couple of them just for space, but managing growth uh, both respectfully and uh, responsibly. It takes balance. There's a lot of competing interests, a lot of different perspectives across the region with all of the different stakeholders and partners that we've worked with. Uh, and it does take a lot to, to try and find balance in the middle of that. So both respectfully and responsibly managing growth. Um, aligning need with the opportunity so that people have what they need in proximity, um, that they have choice in um, housing locations and travel uh, that meets their needs. Community connections, we heard repeatedly from our, our community engagement that the pandemic has really um, broken a lot of social connection, community connection, and working to see how policy can help to encourage rebuilding of that, um, to reestablish some of that. Uh, looking at natural systems uh, as from a from its right to exist in itself for its own value instead of just extracted value, so looking at systems rather than resources. Climate resilience through an EJ lens, really focusing on adaptation and mitigation measures to build local climate uh, resilience through the development process. Looking at equitable development, uh, looking at how um, we can work through policy to remedy discriminatory land use practices uh, and providing tools and resources to local governments on how to do that and doing things differently ourselves as well. Uh, and finally, land use policy supports uh, the economic health of people and connects that with climate change by fostering a green economy. Uh, we have... Sure, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question, Angela. I'm yes. Um, just as an example, equitable development remedy, discriminatory land use practices, I know a lot of us know uh, historically for sure what some of that is. I would say again at the legislature, there was some of that language attached to bills this session that I think could be debated. So will we have some definition around that term so that people know what we mean, maybe as it relates to our authority as the council, or how, how does that come up? Uh, Chair and Council Member Johnson, thank you for asking that. Um, as you know, we were, we've been here uh, several different times talking about the various equity frameworks and some of the work that guides how the Council does our work. Um, that's how we will show up 
Uh, we have an equity statement, so that is defined in uh, the Imagine 2050 as far as what the council means when they're talking about equity. And as far as equitable development practices, you'll see that it's pretty clear in the various objectives, policies, and actions what each one is talking about with cumulatively together hoping that we can remedy those historic uh, in, uh, inequities. Mr. Chair, and thank you. I appreciate that because a lot of times uh, us at the Met Council, people will take top line things for whatever the thing might be that's coming. And um, that's great because they're reading our stuff, but a lot of times it is down deeper to be more specific as to what that really means for the council and how we're doing our work. So thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, so just in the last month, I really wanted to focus on what some of the key takeaways were in the engagement since I've last reported to you, and then just some broad changes that we're adding to for the 60% draft. Um, we heard from uh, our local government partners the real need for clear identification of what they're responsible for, what the council is responsible for, but also from community because they want to know the same things because they're thinking about accountability. Who is responsible for what and what does that accountability look like? So we identified that um, more clearly. Um, and we also heard uh, that there's a need for all community types to be able to see themselves in the plan. So not only urban, suburban, and rural communities all wanting to be able to see themselves reflected in the language, but also for community to see themselves in, in the plan language as well. So I'm lucky enough to be a part of the work with the American Indian Advisory Council and one of the first things that I remember uh, one of the advisory council members asking is, would they be able to see themselves in the plan? And I mean, it really takes you to that accountability level. It's like, can they? And I'm not sure, and if I'm not sure, I know that no one else will be sure because I'm writing a lot of it. And so um, if I'm not sure, then you need to be more explicit about that. And so we can do that uh, as well. Local governments, too, really shared the uncertainty about changing requirements based on new policies. Uh, I think everyone is always uncertain when change happens. Everyone is always uncertain, well, how is that going to affect me? I think that's reasonable to, to want to know, how can I plan for what's coming ahead? We do that all the time for a regional planning agency. And so local governments are thinking along those same lines as well. Uh, we did hear support for things like the transportation and land use connections that we were making and of course the plans for technical assistance resources and the plan for the continuing uh, conversation uh, broad changes include uh, additional context around desired outcomes of some of the policies to be really clear about what it is we're trying to achieve explanation of some planning terms, clarification, concise language, and consistency throughout. So there was a, a lot of consolidation and pairing back. Uh, Eric's policies no longer have 12 policies. So we've really um, reorganized a little bit, making sure that they are um, not repetitive and that they're a little bit more concise. And um, still the important things are in there, but not as verbose. Uh, like I said, more engagement is planned, and so I just want to walk through a couple of that on a few different fronts. Uh, we have five planned uh, forecasting workshops through June and into early July, uh, and those are um, be all throughout the region. I think three are planned to be in person, two are planned to be virtual, and those are conversations for local governments, and Todd Graham and uh, some of my staff are, are leading that effort. Uh, we're planning on partnering with Metro Cities to talk in more detail about regional density issues and various approaches to addressing those issues. And so we are planning, in fact, we set dates for two of those workshops um, for early this summer or mid midsummer, um, and um, how we will kind of pace that and invite people in. We, we know that you want to participate in some of those things and we'll def definitely let you know when those are scheduled so that you can listen in to those virtual meetings. Um, the Regional Planning Advisory Year 2 is having a special meeting to convene around uh, density and land use discussion as well. 
The American Indian Advisory Council continues to meet through July and hopefully coming to the Committee of the Whole in August sometime to share their recommendations. Uh, we'll integrate their work as I continue to be a part of that work and so I have preview and you should see a lot of that work coming <coughs> up in the land use sections. Um, We'll also continue to bring discussion to the council, its committees, and work groups, as well as continuing to coordinate internally. Like, oh, sorry. Um, the fifth bullet under the summer engagement is the rural communities. Oh, yes. Um, I, I'm not sure how rural communities are identified or um, defined, but um, I'm curious as to how they're going to be selected. Um, and I'm also curious about cities that may not be a part of metro cities. So how, how do we make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible? Sure. Chair and uh, Councilmember Bento, thank you for asking that. We had similar questions about that at the RDT working group this morning. Um, first, for on the Metro Cities front, we do have participants that aren't in Metro Cities that are participating in the Regional Planning Advisory Group. And just because Metro Cities is a partner, we are the ones that are leading those conversations, and so we will invite um, all members in. We can't force them to participate, um, but we do encourage and we try to make it as accessible as possible. Um, so we'll offer multiple sessions, which is what we're doing with the forecasting, for example. And then the rural communities, will yeah. that include townships? Uh, Chair and Councilmember Bento, uh, we can uh, refer to Councilmember Wolf. She, and she, through conversations with some of our water folks, uh, really identified a few key participants and they wanted to host um, some uh, meeting in the southern part of the region. I do want I know you to know that. I do want you to know too that we have done robust rural engagement. We've done a comprehensive survey of all rural communities uh, at, throughout the region as well as hosting uh, several workshops all throughout. We, we focused those conversations only on rural and ag policies, so we were talking um, not only with communities in that way, but also producers and suppliers. So we're thinking about the farmers themselves. Uh, we attended some conferences to get more connected into that um, that industry, and so we're really trying to broaden our reach with that as well. And so we have worked quite uh, intentionally to try and bring more rural communities to the table um, and I think that we've had a better response than we have in previous um, rounds. And I just follow up with one more question. What about um, township board leaders and staff? Uh, we have engaged um, with uh, probably the planning staff and the consultants more so since the conversations have largely been at the staff level. Uh, if you're interested in partnering to host a meeting, we're, we'll go out in the community, we'll plan a conversation, we'll work with you to do that. Um, we'll also, like I mentioned, bring the conversation to the council, committees, and work groups, uh, as well as continuing to coordinate internally with other policy areas, including the internal equity and environmental justice teams. We continue to work with our local government partners and community organizations and other stakeholders as well. What's up next is uh, just trying to work towards the public comment uh, draft. As, so as engagement concludes, uh, we'll continue integration and feedback uh, as we have up till now. We'll work on building understanding of various recommendations on density and land use as a part of that. Uh, and internally, we'll review again with the various equity frameworks on the, and the work of the American Indian Advisory Council. As we do that, we'll work to balance feedback of underrepresented communities to ensure equitable integration of feedback. We'll work with the RDG Working Group and CDC when we need additional direction um, and look forward to those uh, conversations. And finally, uh, we'll continue to center equity in our process and policies in response to the Council's direction and regional equity goal to address regional racial disparities. That's me. I'm happy to take any, any questions. questions for Okay. All right, great, thank you. I will ask the housing staff to come up next.
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, or almost evening, uh, Chair and Council Members. My name is Maya Ganetto Combs. I'm a senior planner with the Housing Group in Community Development. I'm here representing the Housing Policy Plan Group, and happy to be here with you all today. So just starting as a quick reminder of the last time we were here, um, you probably remember my colleague Hillary presenting to you all um, when we had been emerging from our time with our housing technical advisory group as well as coming out of our resident um, engagement. And we presented our objectives that were really founded in a lot of that engagement that we had done during that time. Since then, we're in this execution phase, uh, which is highlighted in the blue where we've really been working um, with various internal groups across the Met Council, um, whether that's the housing integration team or other policy areas, as well as council member groups such as the housing work group and the regional development guide working group. Um, we are hoping to present our 60% draft since we didn't get to uh, present that to the community development uh, committee uh, on the 6th. So we'll be presenting that on the 20th. We tried. And <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> um, and if you want to refer to that 60% draft, you can look at the attachments for that meeting um, online. And so uh, throughout all of this, we've been incorporating feedback uh, in the plan and um, refining, 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 right? Um, and so speaking of that... What are some of the key takeaways you've heard? We've heard a lot of feedback. Uh, these are just uh, a few of them that's not comprehensive, um, but we wanted to go over some of these key points. So um, in feedback from both council members and local government staff, very similar to land use, we've heard that we really need to be clear on how this is going to affect local government work and how this is gonna change from 2040 Thrive. And so we're, we're in the process of integrating that and making sure that we're being clear on roles and responsibilities in our, in our plan. Um, clarity on concepts and terms. Housing and development has a lot of jargon, it has a lot of terms, and we need to make sure that we're being clear in defining them. Uh, we got a lot of feedback about uh, missing middle and some other terms that we know are, are um, topics that are being talked about around the region. And so making sure we're defining those and also being mindful of terms such as family, right? We know that family is used a lot in housing policy and it's not always representative of all the households in our region. And in the next point, um, our, our plan focuses a lot on need of affordable housing, but we recognize that housing is needed at all levels of income. And so uh, being clear that um, 60 to 80 percent AMI affordable housing is still very much needed in our region. And then the next point recognizes um, that affordable housing is not the only solution. So um, for low-income households, we need to make sure that we're, we're building and supporting affordable housing that is safe and has access to supportive services. And from cities, we continue to hear that they want to supply deeply affordable housing. It's a really great priority to focus on, but it continues to be the most expensive to build. So how are we addressing that in our plan, and how are we supporting subsidizing deeply affordable housing? And then this is a good pat on the back point. I put this one in to feel great. <laughs> but we heard from city staff that this is a really focused plan. So we have seven objectives and their associated policies, and they're really focused um, and we heard from city staff that that will really make a better end product for cities um, by, by really focusing that plan. So, how about that? <laughs> and so what are we talking about? Um, the 2040 Thrive uh, Housing Policy Plan uh, talked a lot about the need to supply affordable housing in the region. I think that's been clear. We've been talking to a lot of our partners. We know that we have that need for affordable housing supply. The 2050 plan stresses that need, but also wants to make sure that we're grounding what type of affordable housing. Are we meeting the needs of our residents? Are we talking about senior housing? Are we talking about accessible housing? Are we talking about um, housing wealth building opportunities through ownership? So uh, the 2050 housing policy plan uh, has that focus, um, and that's really grounded in resident perspective. So in previous conversations that we've had with y'all, we we talked about how we're grounding our objectives in the resident engagement themes that we heard over the past year and making sure we're hearing what those 
regional issues are and responding to them. And then another focus you'll see is choice. So affordable housing is needed everywhere. How are we increasing geographic and fair housing choice for residents in the region? And ownership. This is a, a large topic. You'll, you know, a lot of people are talking about wealth building when it comes to ownership opportunities, the, the lack of supply of affordable home ownership opportunities, and how are we addressing that in our plan. So that's a focus that we're looking at, as well as quality. So uh, we have a lot of aging affordable housing, and how are we maintaining that affordable housing over time and preserving that, which I kind of jumped ahead preservations a couple, a couple um, bullet points down. And then stability. Another focus is housing insecurity is a growing issue in our region, and we want to make sure that we're addressing that in our plan. And then community connection. So we have our anti-displacement framework, um, which we will be incorporating into the housing policy plan. And we want to make sure that we're ensuring people can stay where they, they live already, and they have access, to, access sorry, to the amenities and services that they need. And environmental justice. How are we incorporating the environmental justice framework in our plan? We've um, uplifted that into an objective to make sure that we're specifically focusing on that in the housing policy plan. What's up next for housing? So in our recent cast, like I mentioned in the first um, <clears throat> slide, we've been working with the housing work group with uh, um, council members. Uh, we've been working with the regional development guide working group. We uh, talked to the local government focus group uh, last week, I believe, or the week before, and we were hoping to present the 60% draft to CDC, but we will be doing that on May 20th. Um, in the future, we will be collaborating with our art and policy visual artists to communicate through art the housing policy plan. Uh, on June 4th, we have a meeting planned with the regional planning advisory group uh, to present this to local uh, government staff. And um, we also have our meeting, I believe, on June 20th with the American Indian Advisory Council to make sure that we're adding that focus and perspective into the housing policy plan. And then I mentioned the housing technical advisory group, which was made up of a lot of housing staff and partners from around the region. We want to circle back to them and say, did we represent you? Did we hear you? Do you see the concepts that we talked about in the plan? as well as with all the resident groups that we talked to um, all through last year. So that's kind of what's next. Um, I hope you come or watch the CDC May 20th, because um, we are excited to talk about um, our 60% plan with you all. Yeah, that's all I have for you all today. Any questions? Can I have a suggestion? Um, for folks who aren't on CDC, if you read the materials prior to Monday and you have a question or a comment, mm -hmm. and want to I don't want us to violate the uh, any uh, open meeting law or Robert's rules but if you have a question that you want to ask let us know and we can ask it for you and that can kind of help speed the process and non-members of a committee can, are welcome to come exactly to mm -hmm. yeah that's what I was gonna and say. watch the meeting. yeah yeah and definitely you can watch it if you don't want to yeah. 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 yeah the other the other thing that, I've heard a couple of references to the Regional Planning Advisory Group. Mm -hmm. Who's on that? Are you talking about the Regional Development Group, or is that? Our no, group this, is, this is the one that Angela was talking yeah. about. Oh, that's okay. through Metro Cities. That has cities that are not. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Chair. <laughs> um, this, yeah, that's exactly what Angela was talking about. So it's through Metro Cities. It's not just the cities that are on Metro Cities, okay. but it is made up of local government staff. Could we get a list of those folks? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. We have a lot of work groups. <laughs> yeah, well, it would be nice to know who's on those work groups sure. so that when we're interacting with local leaders, we can thank them for their leadership and we don't look like we're clueless. Yeah. Or at least any more clueless than we normally are. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Carter. Yeah, two oh, things that stood out. I'm speaking out. for myself. I'm sorry. I was no, I was speaking for myself. Two things that stood out for me. I was glad to see. Uh, the focus on uh, supplying 30% AMI as a great priority. So, and the second one was the continuing focus on environmental justice. Thank you. Yeah. This is also a compliment for the last, the very last couple of bullets where you have the did we hear you right, circulate back. And I, I do know that you said you hope to plan to 
don't have those dates set yet, I appreciate you know that you're going to, and that you also have the opportunity to communicate back early so that those folks, when they come together, can have reviewed and mm -hmm. can have the opportunity to thoughtfully engage. But thank you so much for, for that piece and incorporating the feedback you've heard about that. All right, Rita. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I really like uh, the different groups that are working on the housing plan. It's been really uh, fun and um, exciting to work with council members at the housing work group and seeing how all the different work groups are integrating and how the different segments of our regional development guide are, are integrating. Uh, I was especially uh, pleased with the focus for 2050 and, and the different areas I think is going to allow us to have um, a more thriving region, as particularly related to housing. Um, I think there's new that new focus is gonna allow us to dig deeper and have more continuous improvement um, in those areas and for the community connection um, the life cycle housing as well as addressing the needs for uh, youth as they you know graduate from college or get jobs being able to stay in the communities that they're in as well as the seniors uh, being able to stay in their homes which is becoming more popular and the fact that Met Council is addressing that is, is really good that we're continuing to address that. Great. Judy? Yeah, just briefly. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Councilmember Tyrone Carter, for bringing up the 30%. And I would, and I think I have Wendy Wolf and maybe others, but Wendy Wolf to thank, because I've been saying for many years the 60 to 80 <coughs> or 50 or whatever AMI is very important. And there's been a big shift in recent years at Minnesota Housing and Hennepin County, and probably Ramsey too, um, and Met Council to really focus on the 30 because there's such a desperate need. I will say though, there's, um, I don't want to use the term missing middle, but you know, people who are working and have jobs, but they can't afford the house. You know, those, those development proposals that have come forward at the 60 to 80 or 50 to 80 um, aren't getting through the pipeline because they don't meet the criteria for the deeply affordable. And, and of course, there's not an endless amount of money, but they're critical to the housing pipeline for people that want to move on and maybe a bigger apartment and they've got the job and they can't get into the 30, right? So there's there's uh, so much need in that space too. And then, and then maybe again, throughout your life, you then maybe get into your first home. So I just want to, you know, I don't know how we are going to prioritize that, especially as it relates to grants, you know, we have substantial grants, but they're not they're not the big grants like Minnesota Housing and the private foundations and the other partners can come up with. But I, I and I and I understand that we've got to, you know, make sure that we move people from homelessness into, you know, stability and then finally into, you know, longer term. But I don't want to discount and and I think in the housing sphere, sixty to eighty has kind of been put on the back burner a bit, and I think it's still important as a as a pipeline through housing that we do talk about that because it is very important to people that qualify and have you know a job or two or three in their family and they don't they don't have a place to go because they can't afford the market rate either so um, I just want to put that out there and I just um, want to um, you know thank the staff for working on this the work group it's it's been um, a, a lot we have a lot more work to do but you know, I, I see the comments starting to come out that we're, we've been providing, and that to me is just super helpful. So thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to follow up on, on that comment. I've been hearing from businesses that they especially need that 60 to 80 because if you give somebody a job, they can't get on a waiting list for three years to get into housing. They aren't going to come work for you if they can't find a place to live. And so even if it's a stretch for, you know, for a while or whatever, at least you can find some place to live so that you can take a job and, and we bring people <coughs> to, the, to the region. We, on this whole outreach thing, I don't feel like we've done really any discussion with businesses and, and people who would be investing in the, the region and what they need, but that 60 to 80 is a huge, huge need for businesses. They, the the uh, housing at the lower levels doesn't 
help them at all because of the timeline because it takes so long to get into it. You can build a, a development right next to a factory that needs workers, but there's no guarantee that anybody that works in the factory is going to get housing in that place. So so the 60 to 80 is, is really, really important. Workforce housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, this is um, tied to what Judy and uh, Wendy were saying as well. Uh, and I've often um, said and thought that in order for us to have a thriving community, you want to have all levels of incomes in that community, all levels of housing in that community. Because if we're just building low-income housing for a specific neighborhood, have we done everything that we could to make that neighborhood Thriving. That, I think that's really important. But I, I also wanted to say one more thing, and and that is addressing the challenge of supporting the fifty to eighty percent AMI. Um, and how far is how far are our pocketbook is our pocketbook going to go with fifty to eighty percent AMI? How do we address that challenge in terms of our programs? Um, as well as there's one more thing, hopefully I can remember about that. Oh, I know, um, Wendy was talking about, um, you know, the affordability aspect of the 50 to 80% AMI. It's not just the housing vouchers, which you know, we rely on heavily in terms of supporting communities, but also um, getting homes and apartments according to your income so you don't have to have a waiting list. Now I know that's, that would require a partnership, um, but we can say that we support those types of programs as a as a region, regional body. Do we have? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we have a work group that, or excuse me, a partnership group, whatever, community engagement group with builders, developers in the housing industry? Chair, Councilor Dornetto, we did have a nonprofit and for profit developers represented on our technical advisory group. Um, but I think we can always deepen that engagement, and that could be something that we intentionally target in the next few months. Um, I, Mr. Chair, I, I was really concerned about the uh, legislative proposal for the missing middle. Um, and while I support the rationale, I thought the approach was very counter to what we're about as a planning organization and what in particular our suburbs are about. And it really took a lot of communities, including a neighboring community to my home, not just by surprise, but total shock. Um, excuse me. She shouldn't be calling now. It's it's um, Jeopardy time for my sister and her husband. But anyway, um, I, I just I I would like to have a, a really transparent conversation about housing costs and what we can do collectively as as far as nonprofits and and for profits and government at all levels to try and address that because I feel like. I feel like it's a raging fire, and we're we're just not calling nine one one. You know, we're we're talking about it, kind of. I don't know. We're talking about it, but we're not really getting to the heart of it. And I I have good friends that are developers, and it'll come up at meetings, and um, I you know I don't know what to tell them, and they don't know what to tell me. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So to Council Member Bento's point and the other flip side of the coin, that's my and that's what I'm gonna be saying on this one is we need people to be able to earn living wages. Mm -hmm. And we as a big employer at the council need to make sure we're doing that too. Mm -hmm. Um because affordable housing means if you have enough money to pay for it, right? And so we know that wages have not kept up with housing costs and inflation and all that over the last 20, 30 years or 50 years. So that's where a missing middle starts to show up and then add to it all the stuff going on in the world and you know logistics and tariffs and more tariffs coming out of the White House again. And so I'm, you know, it is a bigger problem and we have really smart people in this region and around this country and we should be able to come together instead of fighting at the legislature on, on a bill or two, whether it's whosoever bill, 
And so I appreciate, you know, I would love to see some sort of a sum slash workshop shop slash forum. We could be a participant. I don't think we have the staffing capacity to lead it, but I, I just think to your point, Councilman Rovento, we're all admiring the problem as we stare at our navels and then complain about it. So Mr. Chair, if I could just add, you know, in addition to the cost of building a home, the utilities are crazy. I mean, it's just, it, it, when I look at and I compare my utility bills from their current amounts to a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, it's just stunning. And I know that <laughs> I'm not dumb enough to not realize that there's a cost of living and there was a pandemic, and but it, it, it adds to the frustration and the challenge for everybody, and especially at that at that 50 to 80 percent once they buy the home then the real heat gets turned up in terms of the cost add to that being able to find affordable comprehensive homeowners insurance that's a nightmare right now and if you haven't had to renew a policy start saving up your your Advil or your Tylenol or whatever and some stomach medication because when you go to renew your house your homeowners in policy you're going to be shocked at what's happened Great. So I'll shut up. Tony. Thank you. I think we're all reaching each other's minds and speaking into the concern that is very, very central to our focus on economic prosperity and wealth building. Certainly, affordability and housing affordability is a problem and an impact across all um, housing levels. And we do have the power to convene. We don't have to be the only person at the table, but to be good partners. We also have the advantage of a recent study that came out just this past couple of weeks, maybe last week. It had been commissioned by McKnight and was produced by the Center for Economic Inclusion. And it is on the importance of living wages and the impact of the lack of the such within our region. So I think that we should ask our staff to consider how we can participate in convening around this issue with various partners and particularly businesses who have every opportunity to understand and live into how we address housing affordability from that other one. So I'm asking that we consider that actively. I had comments. Larry, <laughs> one of the things that I've often thought that uh, we have an employer matching program for education and other things like that. If we could have maybe each look at employer matching programs in the housing area. So, uh, and key employers uh, would possibly be interested in it, particularly if they got some sort of tax break along those lines. But um, so, and it doesn't put the burden totally on an employer or us, and it's more of a, a real partnership. Great. Well, these are great comments and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Judy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'm Judy Spensek. I manage the Water Resources Group, and uh, Jeff Dushewski and I were here less than a month ago to talk about the water policy plan and kind of give you an update on this, where that is at and what's draft is at with that. So I'm gonna. This will be like more of a quick overview for me. Um, like I said, we were here back in April. Um, we, since then, we've had two workshops. We talked about the workshops we were setting up. We've had two workshops. We have one more tomorrow. Um, that will be in Shoreview. We've had really good attendance at, uh, I think, the first meeting in College Grove. I think we had, like, 15 people, and then we had about 25 at the last meeting. We're, I think we're expecting 40 tomorrow, so it's building, so that's good. Um, we have also added another workshop um, coming up at the end of June that uh, Councilmember Wolf helped us set up to help with the 
yeah, rural, get the rural communities there. And then I think we're still looking for ideas and options of how we can kind of really expand the rural participation too if we need another one besides that. But I know we do have something planned at the end of June to kind of pick up that. Um, we've also been incorporating a lot of feedback on where we're at with the policy plan. Just today we had our joint uh, Metro Area Water Supply Advisory and Metro Area Water Supply Advisory Tech Community meeting to kind of go over the water supply part of the water policy plan. So we got a lot of feedback from that meeting that just ended well, an hour and a half ago. <laughs> um, so we've really been continuing with the, the, the input <coughs> engagements. Um, like I said, we talked about this last time. We also, at that meeting, we talked about all the sub-regional meetings we had that ended a couple months ago. So we've been really getting a lot of upfront input. Um, our plan is to bring probably about a 90% draft to the um, June 11th Environment Committee meeting and have a conversation on the whole plan at that point. Just a really quick reminder, these were the four objectives that we talked about last time. Uh, they're related to climate investments, health and equity. So it's really climate needing to further develop a system that can adapt to the increased intensity and frequency of storms. Investments really look at it, including infrastructure for the management of stormwater, wastewater, and assistance for local water supply across um, region. Also includes funding for planning and programs to help sustain the region. Um, health is about intending to uh, protect the well-being of all living things from human health to ecosystem health. And equity is really um, the objective that we're looking there is striving to access for safe, affordable water for drinking, recreation, and cultural and commercial uses. So these are the four guiding objectives that we then have developed policy in these areas. We have these 12 policy areas, as a quick reminder. Um, many of these policy areas are um, interconnected, and we've been getting a lot of input on these from our engagements that we've been having as well. So, what we've been hearing, um, well, the few meetings that we've had so far and the sub-regional meetings we've had over a couple months ago, we've been really getting a lot of support for this plan. We've been hearing that we're on the right track, um, that we really haven't missed any big elements or overstepping. Um, in any way. I know we're going to get some more specific feedback from the meeting we just had today, um, but that's focused on the water supply plan. Um, it's, like I said, overall we're hearing there's a lot of um, comments about the process that we've been using. There's really been um, appreciation of all the sub-regional engagements, the using the water advisory group that we have, using MOSAC and TAC to get input on this, bringing things to the environment committee, and then just now having these four meetings that we've been scheduling with the um, Communities, general public, anybody who would like to attend those, that were really been kind of stepping up the process that we, when we did last time to get input on this. Um, they like the structure of the plan. They find it clear and easy to follow. Um, they're really appreciative of mostly at some of these meetings, just the opportunity to meet with their peers, mm -hmm. talk to each other, learn about other issues that people are having, common issues we're having, and so that figuring out how we can you know work on these now and into the future and working together. So they're really making a lot of connections which is helping our work and which will help us in the, in the future as well. Um, and then one thing, they really like the addition of that workforce development policy that we have, which is the last one we added in there. Um, a lot of communities are really struggling with that, with how, um, you know, workforce development in the water areas. And so by putting this policy in there, they're really appreciative of that, trying to figure out how they will use that in their work in their communities as well. <coughs> So like I said, it's going to be quick. Uh, so there's still more opportunity to share and hear feedback about our plan. Like I said, we have the meeting tomorrow in Shoreview. It's from 1 to 3. Um, and I want to say we really appreciate all the council members who have been able to attend meetings so far. Once again, we have to keep track of forum issues so we don't want to have too many at one meeting. Um, then we have the virtual meeting, which I actually sent out an invite to some council members today who asked for that. So hopefully you were able to get that. Um, if not, let me know. So there, that'll be on March 30th. We've added that meeting in Farmington. And then um, looking for other opportunities. Um, if you have any thoughts on any upcoming meetings you'd like to come us, have us share this information and get feedback on or anything you think we're missing, let us know and we can certainly try to add that into our schedule. As you know, it will be like, you know, we're trying to get things obviously resolved into a draft that can be approved in August and then, you know, we'll have time to make adjustments after that too. Um, any questions on where we're at, I guess? Sure. Mr. Chair, thank you. I was at the Cottage Grove meeting. It was excellent. Mm -hmm. I think that the one part of it that Judy didn't know, but I think is very important to note, is the number of, of, of uh, 
MCES staff who were there and a part of the conversation was really impressive. And I think that meant a lot to those, those local folks that were at the meeting. So thank you to you and your colleagues, Judy. It was great. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Council Member Bento. I should have mentioned, yeah, we've had all the authors. We have a pool of people writing this different sections of the plan. They've all been attending these meetings to learn, to listen, as well as um, our general manager, Lisa Thompson, and some of our executive leadership were there. So I think people really appreciated having that level at there and hear the concerns as well. Real quick, uh, Mr. Peter, Chair, we Peter. were at the <coughs> Council of Mayors yes. meeting on Monday. Uh, you did a great job of talking about transit safety, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but then the next topic on the agenda was water. And uh, there's a big effort being led by the Minneapolis Foundation, region wide or maybe even statewide effort um, that uh, is going to be happening in the months ahead. Um, uh, Sue, your comment about Cottage Grove reminded me that uh, there was a comment at that meeting from Woodbury Mayor who said Woodbury had spent four, was, was, was it like 40 million or 400 million on uh, DFAs? It, it, it was 40 a million so far. It's a huge yeah. number. Oh, yeah. It was a ginormous yeah. number yeah. for one city yeah. to spend on clean water yeah. just in the last few years. It's probably a bit, it's just the yeah. tip of the iceberg yeah. um, mm -hmm. for the East Metro. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyways, I know that uh, Sam uh, Connell was very engaged in the uh, uh, Minneapolis Foundation water conversation. But, um, I want to get that on your radar screen. I have a um, copy of the presentation. I was going to reach out, but I, since Peter mentioned it, I think that uh, there idea of reaching out to uh, mayors, cities uh, this year, and we talked, gives opportunity for Peter and I to say that uh, we are engaged in this year of planning, and, and uh, water is one of our components, so uh, expect to make a connection. I think, at the very least, uh, they will amplify uh, some of the concerns and goals that we have, and I think it could be helpful if we just maybe connect at some point. And Mr. Chair and Council Member Lester, I was going to mention, so Jim Westerman from Woodbury was at our meeting today at the Mossack TAC meeting, and so we had a similar conversation about the, the amount of money they're spending on it. And that was another thing he said was really important from our engagements. He's connecting with neighboring communities. I mean, they're all, like, especially with PFAS, having to deal with a lot of money, but they're trying to come up with joint solutions. And, you know, is there a way to make it more feasible? They're all going to have to treat for some way or another, but it's like, can we do this together or learn from each other, if nothing else? So. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Mr. Sure. Mr. Chair, it, you know, the, the reality is is that the, that the East Metro area is has been a real lightning rod as it relates to the PFAS. Mm -hmm. Every community is going to deal with it because of the amount of PFAS we're using in an everyday sort of way, and I won't ramble on like I did the last time I talked about it, but um, it's not going away, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect everybody, and so... Woodbury is going to be quite an example for the rest of the region. Well, in addition, we had comments from the northeastern part of the metro uh, with uh, Mayor Brainerd and Matamita and some others who are concerned about water supply. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's a, something we're studying, and uh, that's another issue. Several of them were saying, please, Met Council, step in and help us mm -hmm. coordinate uh, this regional challenge that we're having. Thank you, Judy. All right. Thank you. I'm going to pass it on we're, to we're, you. We're ready for more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Seltz Pub, Judy, and Summer. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where you get all those things? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 40 people. Pretty good. And we can't have parks without water. <laughs> Exactly. Emmett Here we Mullen. are. Thank you, Chair and Council Members. I'm Emmett Mullen, and I'm the Regional Parks Manager. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the Parks team was last here in February um, of this year, and, uh, and so we're going to give a little update on where we've been since then. 
um, our progress to date and, uh, and so forth. Um, I want to share a high-level update today uh, since that time, what we're learning and, and where we're heading. I also want to call out, um, and this was Council Member Vento brought this to my attention, but I didn't know, but Kids to Parks Day is this coming Saturday. So uh, we looked across the agency websites, and, and there are a number of celebrations to help people get outdoors, especially families and kids, and um, we're going to be pushing some of that information out on social media. So thanks for bringing that up uh, to my attention. Um, so where, where have we been since February? Uh, well, we've been a lot of places, um, making the rounds with partners and community. Um, we've been uh, meeting um, with the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space monthly. That's really been a core group for us uh, with Councilmember Vento. Um, they have been with us every step of the way in the policy development process. Um, providing critical feedback and guidance. Um, so I wanted to start there and I'll just continue clockwise. Uh, additionally, we've been working with the Community Development Committee. We've been there several times, um, keeping them in the loop and getting a lot of feedback and advice. Um, the regional park implementing agencies, our 10 regional park implementing agency partners, we meet with them monthly. We had a workshop with them. Um, in March, uh, we're meeting with them again tomorrow morning. Um, our council implementing agency work groups, um, we've formed a lot of work groups. I can't remember exactly, but I think we have eight or nine to date around the key topics in the plan. Um, they have been meeting regularly these past several months. We're kicking off our final uh, regional trail, regional bicycle transportation network. Uh, work group later this month, um, so that's the last one to get off the ground. Um, but the regional park implementing agencies are in the center of our work. Uh, this past month, um, we met with the Parks and Trails Legacy Advisory Committee. Um, that's a 16-member um, group that's for, with people from across the state. Um, we met on the shores of Lake Waconia, Councilmember Barber, in the brand new Paradise Commons. It's a B3 building, it's unbelievable. It's, it's really state of the arts, the visitor center, uh, worth a visit. Um, and we brought a number of topics to discuss uh, to the Parks and Trails Legacy Advisory Committee, but in particular, we brought the idea of um, cultural, uh, cultural landscape classification, um, and um, that was the topic they really wanted to dig into and discuss, and we got just some amazing feedback, um, I think, from that group. Um, finally, with the help of uh, our new um, tribal liaison, Allison and Angela, um, we presented to the, or I presented to the American Indian Advisory Council um, in uh, April. Got some great feedback on a wide range of topics including the cultural landscape classification, uh, harvesting or foraging, um, the desire to create a more coordinated approach to stop trying to wear people out. I think that there is, we could do better in terms of like how we get out into community, um, you know, really organizing better on our end. Um, so that's, that's where we've been. Um, this, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Oh yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and the, I'm just going to ask about the participation from the implementing agencies. So you have the directors meeting, you have the uh, council work groups, and so are all 10 participating? Is it robust participation? More uh, dominant? Yeah, not to like overstate it, but it's, it's a really grassroots effort. Hmm. They are involved in every work group. When we ask, like Colin Kelly's organizing this regional trail, regional bicycle transportation network, um, work group and every agency we ask to participate, put someone forward. Um, they're really excited to get into this, the regional trail system, fastest growing part of our system. And so, like, we, we've had exceptional engagement. Um, we recently put out our 60% plan, uh, starting with the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission. 
a few days before that meeting, we sent the 60% draft to our park agencies and we created like a form for them to provide comments. So we really are trying to, to work closely with them. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for pointing that out. So uh, key changes proposed in the um, this version of the regional parks policy, parks and trails policy. Um, some of this is basic, but the introductory sections used to be really voluminous in our last parks policy, and we've really streamlined it. We're pulling a bunch out into the regional development guide that will um, where, where it will reside for all of our policy areas. Um, but we did provide a new summary of recent uh, parks and trails research findings and also what we've been learned from our targeted engagement work. Um, in the system plan section, the system plan is sort of the description of what are the, you know, what makes up our system. It's sort of the core ingredient to who we are. Um, we are proposing adding a new classification to reside next to regional parks, park reserves, regional trails, and special recreation features. We're proposing uh, cultural landscape classification. I've I mentioned that, but I just wanted to make sure you knew. So there's been a lot of interest and support for this. Um, I think that this new classification will move forward as part of our 90% plan. That's kind of what we're feeling. Um, the second new classification proposal is this open space and natural areas classification. And I think this time, this needs a little bit more time to, to simmer. Uh, the idea is good, but it, um, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there. Is it only public land? Is it public and private partnerships? So I think this one is going to flow into our work plan, which is our final chapter in the parks policy. Um, the natural systems chapter, so I'm just going down. It's been reworked. Uh, this used to be, as, as we've said uh, probably too many times, our siting and acquisition chapter. Well, why do you site and acquire? It isn't just to have... It, it's really to protect the key natural features of our region. And so we moved the acquisition policy to be a, an action. And so it's, it's reframed. It's, it's, I think it's a lot, lot more logical and it recognizes that we're acquiring high quality natural areas. And uh, in order to provide access, like access to people. Uh, climate resilience. This is a brand new policy area for the parks policy. Some might say, well, I'm overdue, uh, but, but it's there and it's there uh, in a really strong way. There's six actions that are focused around council research. Um, so what we're doing, agency coordination, particularly around some of the climate action planning, public awareness and education. Um, council member Lindstrom, you commented on citizen science. Well, that's going to be a part of this. So it's a really new like area. We have a lot of work to do, but, but I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, the planning and system protection parts of the parks policy, I'm not going to mention too much other than to say they're pretty foundational for what we do in the parks unit, and they're not really changing. We're looking to streamline them, make it easier for the agencies to like fulfill the planning requirements, but make it make more sense. The equity requirement, for instance, was sort of a standalone. Now we're going to integrate it into the public engagement aspects of it because the two are one and the same in my mind. Uh, certainly, there's overlap. It's kind of like the Venn diagram idea. Uh, recreation facilities and programming. Um, we are centering this work in equity cross-sector coordination and raising awareness of regional parks and trails. Uh, we're moving away from the static list of el eligible activities. You know, we've heard from a lot of people. That was a list created in 1974, which was 50 years ago. And, uh, and it's time to move forward toward a more criteria-based system that meets new and emerging needs. Um, finally, in the finance system, we're breaking that section into two parts just to be super clear what are actions that we have control over and what are statutory requirements so um, we undertook uh, one of our work groups was a strategic funding work group 
which people were very interested in. Got great participation on that one. Uh, with the park agencies to create a, a long-term approach to more strategically funding our regional parks and trails system. Some of this work will be captured in the parks policy plan. Some will continue forward through other venues like the legislative process and other things. So, um, so that, those are some of the key uh, changes proposed. This is my last slide. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we are continuing on our path to the 90% draft plan. This is like we are actively writing right now. Um, we will continue our discussion of the proposed cultural landscape classification with our park agency partners. Uh, we met on Monday with the um, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council cultural resource specialists. They are advising that we go forward into the closed session of the MIAC meeting. Lisa's going to cover that one for me because I'm out of town. Thank you. Uh, but, but it's really exciting. That, and, and Allison is someone that is opening doors for us in really amazing ways. Um, we're launching the Regional Trail, Regional Bicycle Transportation Network Work Group. I've said that a few times now. I will stop. Uh, we'll continue to engage our park agency partners, um, our Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission, and you. Um, and finally, we'll continue to work on this thing we're calling the Parks and Trails Planning Handbook. This is something that Lisa Barajas has really encouraged us to do because we're pulling the more procedural elements out of our plan and putting it into something that is being developed in parallel we're bringing that to the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission in early June at our June meeting. Um, so um, we are moving forward. Um, we are making a lot of progress and we have work to do. So uh, thanks for your time today. Um, I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions or suggestions. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment. I'm really excited to see actually the coordination, a little more coordinated effort between regional trails and the RBT because we had a lot of questions, <coughs> and especially in some of the outer, um, more suburban areas. Uh, well, we've got all these, you know, recreational chair trails and things like that. Mostly, like, it doesn't necessarily. It could be part of the the bike network, the transportation network, and they may not be aware of it or how those connections are. So it's even when you you come to the parks group to try and get funding, you go to TAP to try and get funding in some of those pieces. So I'm glad to see that coordination because so we get a lot of questions about what, where do we go with this. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Judy. And uh, two things. So um, going after Dub. Um, yes, and with the, with the counties getting their new funding and having much more flexibility on where it can be applied, it can be layered. So, um, you know, we can be, I think, uh, a good source of information um, to maybe help people stack their requests. And then I really like the section, too, on defining um, what is uh, perhaps, you know, met council policy policy in this section versus uh, legislative requirements. I think that somehow could show up in other mm -hmm. parts of the plan. Because, I mean, even when I got here, I'm just like, oh, that's state law. So we don't, we, you know, we oftentimes will go, we really hear you, <laughs> but here's here's what we are mandated to do. And so, I don't know, I don't want to, you know, we're going along pretty quickly here, but I just think it's very astute for the user and the reader and everybody else who comes to our stuff to figure out what we do and what we don't do, that it's separated in such a way that makes it clear. So I am digging all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Robert. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Really to lift that up, and I agree. We talked a little about this in the Community Development Committee as well. But to see that differentiation between statutory and policy, essentially, and I feel like there's an opportunity there to to do something sort of comparative, right, and to see what levels that each, whether it's state or even local, more local, who's sort of meeting their um, statutory requirements and who's not. And I just think to be really transparent about it. You know, so I, I look forward to seeing that piece developed. Any other questions? I was just going to add, um, this is not directly related to our parks plan, but 
Emmett not mentioned the Kids to Parks event on, on uh, Saturday, and that's a nationwide um, celebration every year. And uh, there's a wonderful organization called the National Park Trust. Actually, they've been active here in, in this city um, in a couple of our parks and along the river. But tomorrow morning, they're going. To, the executive director is going to be on the third hour of the Today Show, which would be around um, 9 o'clock, to present an award to Al Roker for his phenomenal advocacy in parks. So if you happen to be near a television, you can find NBC sometime after 10 o'clock. He'll be getting this cool award, and it's coordinated with National Kids to Parks Day. So just wanted to throw that in there. Great. Thank you. Okay. So this is a little bit of a different topic. Um, and I was doing a lot of reading um, in some journals. But has the Met Council tracked this kind of what's called the green space paradox, where um, residents who historically have not had access to green spaces, but they're also the most likely to be displaced when new green spaces are created in their neighborhoods, because now it's seen as a thing of wealth. Um, Yale has a review, and, and I just got an article, which I'm trying to get printed so I can send it to you so you can look at it. But it's a very serious ongoing issue that it also it causes displacement because now green space is seen as an amenity. An amenity. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, if we're embedding equity into our plans, then um, there's probably, you know, somebody in your department that can do a little bit of research as well. I'll send the, the latest article, an American Scientist article, which kind of summed it up, but it's getting worse as land is getting tighter. So, yep, let's add a park, and then you'll cause gentrification and people will get pushed out. So I think that it's, um, like I say, I'm just reading off a Yale article and a Harvard article on various things that I do for fun. Um, so I think it's... Um, <laughs> and, We're not commenting on that. And, and <laughs> what's, in, what's interesting, it says here that, that, that linear developments are the ones that cause the most displacement because they're seen as transportation. So I thought that was really, really interesting, like the High Line in Manhattan, the 6006 in Chicago, Beltline in Atlanta, because that really drives up the peak real estate because now you're close to a transit lane for bikers and now with e-bikes, now you can spend your money and ride your fancy e-bikes. Um, but anyway, I'd like to see some kind of discussion I mean, it's it's good to no no good heavy bikes, but I've seen it they are expensive. So what did I do to you? Um, <laughs> we get a rebate. We get a rebate. Um, but anyway, I think it would be interesting to have that discussion someplace in the plan. Yeah, that's it's, that's it's that's, really that's really a good point. And since we've really been thinking a lot about anti-displacement for that transit infrastructure, mm -hmm. we should be thinking about it broadly. Broadly, and then and also with the equity. So yeah. i just like to bring that up as a topic. And I'll, Maybe for the transit way advancement policy. The, the, it's behind a paywall, which is the article I'm trying to get it off the paywall, but I can scan it in and yep. send it to you guys. You'll, you'll have to do a 30-day you know, free period. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for the record, I'm a recreational rider, and Ryan has a commuter on an e-bike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do like the UK thing. I don't. I but I just thought it was so interesting that this article came, you know, and then I just did some more research on it. It's like it's a real thing, really happening. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, Tony. When we have that conversation, also I know the Trust for Public Lands has done a lot of that, that yeah. research, mm -hmm. and some of the solutioning around that has to do with using um, property that isn't currently well used, like schoolyards. So that can become certainly a part of the considerations that we add to our plan. You just don't want to get smacked on the back. And bringing prosperity to your point isn't necessarily a bad thing when it is that in areas that have been mm -hmm. previously marginalized. I have, I have no TKO. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And also, uh, for the record, uh, there's good things happening with children in parks this weekend. There is the groundbreaking of the walk on TP Wanakapi next Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, 
And I think they're very happy that their technical fix on the funds that came through this agency. Thanks to you and the council for helping orchestrate that. Yes. I'll take total credit, even though somebody else did. Uh, Tony, I saw some things lying around, but if we haven't gotten a memo about it, could we about that time? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Make sure we send that around. I think it's time for a call. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not kicking myself off. Thanks. No, no. Anti displacement, no. great comments. I'll talk to you. Good segue <laughs> from water to park to transportation. Good Welcome. afternoon. Um, I'm Paul Henniker, Senior Manager of Multimodal Planning and the TPP Project Manager. I just want to start by acknowledging that Parks has the best pictures in their slides. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I like buses, I really want to just go back and stare at the butterfly photo a little bit more. I, I think pictures of buses are beautiful. I, I know I got you. Uh, <laughs> so a couple of quick reminder slides. We have uh, a committee structure that works in the TPP that's been working really hard over the last two years and want to just give them a lot of credit for helping us develop the draft that we have. Um, starting with the technical working group, and I'll talk more about them a little bit later, but they are a lot of county and city and transit providers, staff, along with MnDOT and other folks uh, that's been meeting monthly for two years. The TPP advisory work group is a policymaker group with TAB and Met Council members and a few other state agency representatives. They've been meeting approximately monthly, um, and so a lot of work that those groups have been doing to help us produce the best possible plan. We also have some technical working groups that are specific to transit and bike ped that have been working on this as well. So um, really great structure for us and um, all of that of course advises TAB and the Met Council on the ultimate recommendation of a draft. So reflecting on all the work we've been doing for two years, you know, we started with, with some great work on developing a transportation system performance evaluation um, by the way, these are, those are links if you wanted to explore those in more detail after the meeting. Um, really gave us a lot of great foundational information going into the TPP update. Um, we, we worked on a number of studies, you know, going back even four or five years that helped help inform the TPP. I just have a few examples here, but just know that there's been over a dozen studies that we've conducted in transportation planning to help produce a better plan. Uh, many of you were, were part of or attended some of the listening sessions we had. Um, we had 50 plus listening sessions, mostly in the spring of 2023, to help shape a lot of the early content in the TPP and just hear what some of the issues that we should be addressing. And so we have actually summary presentations, and I know I presented that to you all last year at the Committee of the Whole, um, some of that information. We drafted objectives, policies, uh, and actions uh, along with our investment chapters. Uh, we formed policy development teams. Um, at, at the time I, I drafted this, we had 2,000 plus technical comments on all this content. I'll say at this point, we have over 3,000 wow. um, comments from all of our partners, including TAB and Met Council members, which some of you did submit comments on draft content. Um, we worked on funding assumptions. We had to spend a lot of time, mostly Amy Venowitz, on adapting our funding assumptions to reflect the 2023 legislative session, which was obviously a massive change for transportation funding. As I said, we had those, those uh, working groups, so 23 meetings of the technical working group and 14 of the advisory work group. Um, the advisory work group's last meeting is actually this Friday, and the technical working group's last meeting was uh, last week. So we did uh, have policymakers, Met Council members, were all shared some of our early drafts of the TPP content. Um, we also shared it with TAB and TAC, which is the Technical Advisory Committee to the TAB. Um, we did present this uh, early content to you in February, and then the, the deadlines have been over the last few months in terms of getting comments back to us. I will note we provided a summary of the comments we received from all the Met Council members in the uh, business or in the agenda today. We're not planning to address any of them specifically today, but just there for information and, and if folks want to discuss anything from that list. Feel free to bring that up during the discussion. Um, 
the, the finance and investment chapters comments were due yesterday. We do not have a summary of those yet, but um, we will pull, pull that together once it's available. Um, and then just one other note, we are planning to have a discussion with TAB on June 12th, which will be essentially the same as this, our last update with TAB ahead of their action to recommend the TPP for release for public comment. And so we're hoping to get some direction from the advisory work group this Friday on any issues that they feel like are worth queuing up for TAB in June. So we have a big plan. The TPP is very robust. Um, you all would have been shared most of this content already, but just wanted to give you a sense of what all is going to be in the draft document that we put out. So we, on the left there, you see uh, all of our different investment plans and, and, and the funding uh, assumptions that we pulled together. So we have specific documents dedicated to all of those systems. Um, one of the ones that is unique here is the aviation plan. Uh, this TPP will, will have it be more self-contained. Its, its issues are not really the same as surface transportation. The aviation plan has separate policies and actions from the rest of the TPP. So in some ways, it'll, it'll kind of stand alone as a document. Um, and it's not subject to the same federal requirements as surface transportation. Um, we do also, we've shared all the, the work program. We're, we're finalizing our performance outcome chapters. And then we have a lot of supporting appendices that either provide more detail on topics or satisfy certain federal requirements. And so just a lot of content. I say in total, this is probably over 500 pages of content that our staff have been producing. So really my point here is to say we've been working hard on this stuff, uh, producing a lot of content over the last six to nine months. Um, the one other piece I wanted to touch on is the actual, there's a chapter within the regional development guide that will be focused on uh, the transportation policy plan. And so this is in addition to all the content I just covered. Um, one of the few things that we have to make sure to cover is context that's important and specific to the TPP. Uh, many of you know the planning area for transportation is slightly larger than the seven county metro, so we do have to establish that. Um, as well as any, uh, we want to talk about our plan development process, you know, who we engaged, how the committee process was structured. That's always important for the feds to see in terms of how did we incorporate uh, a variety of perspectives in the plan development. Um, you all uh, were, did, were given an opportunity to review what were called the, the goals chapters. Um, we are actually going to uh, repurpose those to serve as the foundation of the Regional Development Guide chapter on transportation. And so those sections largely cover uh, what our objectives are in transportation that build on the goals, uh, the policies that we have to help implement those objectives, the context for why those objectives are important and why they were chosen uh, for the TPP, and then a high-level summary of investments and performance outcomes. So some of that's going to be duplicative of the other content, but it'll be at a more high level, um, what I, I like to call like the policymaker summary level of information. And I did want to note a number of the comments that we got from council members and TAB members during that initial review of those was that they had too much context um, and that they could be streamlined some and perhaps there was some content that would overlap with regional development guide context like how do we define equity, what's an equity framework, um, what is the impacts of climate change more broadly. So we are working to, to slim those down and make sure that they're focused on transportation and really specific to why do we have the objectives that we have in the TPP. And we're making a lot of great progress on that this week. Um, I did wanna to touch on a few comments we got on the objectives. I know we spent a fair amount of time at this group talking about them. Um, the first set of comments under dynamic and resilient related to the, the idea that uh, folks were commenting on the fact that we have uh, a statement about predictable travel times without excessive delay, and it was focused on highways. And why would we say that all modes should be predictable and reliable um, and have it not have excessive delay? And so really the purpose of this was the second objective there, the green language is what we're proposing to add, and the red language is what we're proposing to strike, is to say that we want to make sure that the travel options beyond driving alone are thoroughly improved, not just reliability and, and delay, but you know, affordability, um, directness, we have reliability in there, um, we have uh, travel time improvement. So we're kind of broadly improving bike, ped, transit modes. 
And highways, we're focusing on predictable and reliable travel times because that mean, that's what means the most to drivers in terms of where we have gaps in the system and that we're focused on reducing excessive delays. So we thought that providing that focus language would, would really clarify those. We're not sure that it really does. I mean, it's still kind of confusing, but it's really hard to write these in a way that makes them truly um, distinct without <coughs> getting that pushback on why aren't we saying this about all modes and all parts you know, of the system. So those two are really complementary objectives. They go together, they're not independent. Um, the, yeah. Um, can you uh, more clearly define um, what you mean by directness related to travel options? Yeah, um, council member and, and chair, the, the directness really relates to where can we alleviate barriers to the system and have more direct routes. So you think about one example would be uh, if a person on a bicycle has to go a quarter mile out of their way to cross a highway, that's an indirect path for them. So if we can provide a more direct crossing of that barrier where they want to cross, that would be making it a more direct trip. There's other examples of that in pedestrian realm and even transit, you know, thinking about how can we eliminate, alleviate routes, you know, going too far out of their way to serve demand and, and be more direct. So it's primarily about that idea of direct route. Okay, so for example, if you're at a parking ride and you want to get somewhere else in your city in the suburbs, you have to go downtown Minneapolis to get back right. a little less so direct yeah right. <laughs> and we and we've certainly heard that feedback about providing more of those connections that aren't you know aren't did in the hub and spoke model okay moving on so the climate change objective changes that we have are, are pretty, pretty straightforward um, we we wanted to align first our language with the rest of the regional development guide that focuses on greenhouse gas emissions it's a little bit more direct language you know transportation's contributions to climate change is it's kind of indirect language, and we're really talking about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we also heard that the word trust is a bit of a loaded term with some of our partners, and so we really wanted to change that to talk about reliable access. That's what we mean. We want people to have access reliably to charging infrastructure so they feel more confident that they can own an electric vehicle without inconvenience. Um, and the last change there to natural systems is truly just to align with the rest of the regional development guide. Um, you know, I think our past version of that objective with the red language was focused on limiting our impact. We don't just want to limit our impact, we want to protect and restore natural systems. And so we added that language to align with the rest of the regional development guide. So I'd say the, the first two objectives under dynamic and resilient are the more um, trying to provide more clarity. The other ones, I think, are more just cleanup language, kind of. Um, we can pause just for a second there to see if there's any questions. Judy. One quick question. Um, under the third bullet point and under climate change objectives, by 2050, the region reduces vehicle miles traveled by 20% per capita below 2019. 2019 was chosen again. Why? Just curious. <laughs> yeah, so um, great question. We, we primarily did that to align with the statewide multimodal transportation plan objectives and targets, uh, but it also is pre-COVID in which there was dips. So we wanted to have more of a baseline that's consistent with the trends we're still seeing. And that was kind of a blip in the radar or a blip in the trend. So it's more aligned with the straight line trend. Okay, so it, it's again, it's attached to the statewide goals. Yes, okay. and definitely attached to the statewide goals. Is that any, well, most people figure that out, I mean, all of y'all in transportation. I just was looking at it like how they come up with that, figuring is attached to something, but just a thought. Yeah, and, and maybe just to clarify, so those, when I was talking about those goals, chapters, that context about how this stemmed from the statewide multimodal transportation plan, all that context is in that chapter. Okay, great, thank you. Peter, I'm just curious, the 20% <clears throat> goal, um, how does that relate to the conversation we had yesterday at the Climate Working Group with MnDOT and their mm -hmm. sub-allocation mm -hmm. that they're working on? And call a friend. Yeah, I'm looking at Amy. <laughs> yeah, phone a friend. Because I was in there yesterday. I was aware the conversation was happening. Okay, was great. Out there. <laughs> Welcome, Amy. Yeah. Mr. Chair and members, so... Some of you may know MnDOT in, um, was it just last year? Is required to set um, 
a greenhouse gas sub allocations for the state. And so we had them come in and talk to us about how are you going to do that because they are required to do it for the metro area. And I think it's safe to say they don't really know yet how they're doing it. And one of our concerns, of course, is we're going to get a higher allocation than the rest of the state. Right. And um, so I don't have a great answer for you as to what it's going to look like. Um, but they have committed to giving us that uh, as a comment to the TPP. And then we would incorporate it. And I don't think we really, under the legislation, have a choice in that. See. So it could be like a 20, if I could, Mr. Chair, could that be like a 25%? So like the overall goal is 20%, but our sub, our region sub allocation could be 25% yes. or 30% or whatever. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, yes. And part of uh, one of our discussions is going to be, is it, if it's per capita, um, which it could be, or it could be a total amount, it could be per capita, they could give it to us in five year increments, um, and they could also do it by land use type or by community type, which is one thing they've been talking about. What are the capabilities of different community types in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions? So we are committed to helping them set the sub allocation and um, we can do a lot of the analysis along with them part we're a little out of alignment you can see that um, obviously our transportation policy plan and the regional development guide are going to be out for public comment starting late this summer into the fall and MnDOT under the state law has to adopt the sub allocation in February, I believe, of 2025. So we press them to move their timeline up. They're going to be doing engagement this summer. We hope to make sure that that's joint engagement and that we're out there together talking about what the sub allocation for the metro area is. But then once MnDOT essentially adopts it, they're adopting it for us. Right, and then, like you said, we put that into our our documents. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, and that's um, thank you. Um, so, like, that's why here in this, like, the climate objectives has generic that minimizes gas greenhouse gas emissions because we're still waiting for all of the other information to tie in, um, and obviously we'll get everything linked as things happen. But yeah, as you review these things, there's. There's some reasons why there's a little vagueness about it because we're waiting for the rest of the work done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. All right. Any, Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Yep. Just one more slide, I think. Yep. Um, so, one other area I wanted to update you all on was um, policies and actions. We did receive a fair amount of feedback on our policies and actions, and a reminder that we had policy and action development teams that were topically focused around the different goals for the, for the long range plan. One of the feedback items that we got was um, that we have too many actions. Uh, we actually have 100, we had 190 actions when we put this out, and the comments were that's not very strategic. You know, if you say you have 190 <laughs> actions. But I think that one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that our plan isn't just about strategic action in one area. It's about multiple areas of strategic action. So we've decided to add what we're calling action tags um, for now. It's a, it could be a tool that implementers of the plan you know, use to filter actions to say which ones are relevant to this type of work I'm looking to do. You can also filter by mode. They're already organized by goal. And so it's going to be a little bit more useful to, to think about how do these actions apply to specific things you're working on at the time. And so we originally had had only three tags, regional solicitation, reminder, we gave out about a billion and a half dollars over the last 10 years from the solicitation. It's a big part of what the TPP does. Um, we, we changed that to investment priority because we also direct um, MnDOT's investments in the state highway system in the metro area and of course Metro Transit has and other transit providers have investment priorities that the TPP informs. 
Uh, we changed comprehensive planning to local planning to be more inclusive of things like corridor studies um, or other studies that aren't comp plan related like transit provider system planning, things like that. So it's kind of broad planning efforts that local implementers are doing. Um, we also added a category called technical capacity building. So one of the things the TPP acknowledges is that we have to learn a lot more about a lot. And we have a lot of work program items, but also just a lot of um, what I call that convening role, you know, forming committees to talk about issues, to better understand them. So a lot of our actions are in that category of just capacity building and having discussions and conversations. Um, and then we have partner actions. We actually have actions in the TPP that tell others what to do. Uh, in particular, MnDOT, because our plan, as I said, directs a lot of their work. And so we need to, at least in the metro area, we need to give them direction on how to implement the TPP. And so we think those tags help clarify, you know, it's not 190 uh, actions, it's actually, you know, 40 on investments and 50 on capacity building. Um, the other thing we did get a comment that the, the actions seem too oriented towards um, transit, biking, and walking. I did a quick, <coughs> quick summary or assessment of our actions. You know, the bulk of them are multimodal. They apply to all modes. You know, they're, they're things that you should consider when investing in general. Uh, but then we had a fairly good split, I thought, uh, across the different modes in terms of roadway, transit, TDM, bike, pet, and freight. So I think that's more of a perception issue than it is a reality in our actions. Um, and we didn't get any detailed comments about this is an unnecessary action or you're missing these. So um, that was just something that we're trying to maybe do some education on. Um, one area that we did add an action in response to comments was we have heard that the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network does not fully cover the, the seven county metro area, it leaves out some rural areas. Council members that serve rural areas might have heard this from local governments, and so we did add an action to explore ways to reflect regional bicycle transportation network priorities in rural areas. We, didn't, you know, we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, so that's an action to just explore that with our partners. Um, so that's the one area where we added an action, actually, in response to comments. Um, so with that, um, that's all I have today, and this is probably the last time we're gonna talk about the TPP um, ahead of, of an action coming later this year, so. Um, I guess I'd just say, Deb, if you wanted to add anything about the process. Yeah, oh, Deb. I do, I do. First of all, I, uh, we've been meeting for two years, so this okay. is a group that has council members, agency representatives, people from TAB, um, you know, a very broad ranging group. Um, we've had extraordinary support from our staff, from Cole, also through Mike uh, and Jim Hansen, um, others who have kind of supported keeping us organized because we can be like herding cats sometimes and it's much appreciated. Um, but um, I think it's been what I have seen with this and having gone through update processes before is I think this is a much more people focused plan and to take something, a technical area like transportation and make it people focused is, is a pretty significant thing and, and a big milestone, I think. Um, I also want to thank the council members who served on this, so when I was prior term, we had uh, council member Francisco Gonzalez, Diego, Sue, and John Pacheco, who are serving on it now. Um, really appreciate the time and effort that everyone's put in. I think it's been, you know, helped us make this a very, very good thing, so. Yeah, and I might add, I didn't get a chance to put this in the presentation, but last Thursday, as I said, we had our last technical working group, and we did ask them about the process. We wanted to get some, you know, what worked, what would have been better. We got a lot of what worked, feedback from the technical working group. They really liked how we made documents available online, so multiple commenters could see what other agencies were saying and could kind of support and maybe even thumbs up, you know, hey, I really like this comment. Um, folks really liked the process that we went through, all the information we provided. The only negative feedback we got is people said it would have been nice to meet in person once or twice <laughs> because they were like, you know, I didn't really get to know these people that I was spending all this two years with because there wasn't that kind of ancillary um, time to, to socialize. That was really the, the biggest negative feedback. You have to have a celebration. Yeah. We should do that. We, we have thought about meeting doing Friday, a cake. So. Yeah, so the advisor work group is going to be asked the same question, you know, what worked, and we would certainly bring that forward uh, when the council action comes about the feedback we got for that process. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, at, as a newcomer to the transportation conversations a year ago and to all of this, I, I just have to really commend the staff. Really impressive. And I, I want to note that one of the conversations that I enjoyed the most was the one in Dakota County 
the day I showed up late because Siri had me going all over Rosemount. <laughs> anyway, I think she drinks at lunchtime. But, uh, but oh, I keep forgetting that these are recorded, so I should really watch myself. Um, you met Siri, though. You'll be hearing yeah. Siri from Siri soon. I know, I will. Um, um, but what I, what I have to say I really loved about that meeting was the point at which there wasn't a computer, and it just generated into a conversation that wasn't... It wasn't compu It wasn't driven by the computer and the voting and the. It it just really opened it up and, I, I, I would hope that um, between now and the 2060 plan, we try and create more of those kinds of conversations, at the county and local levels because I just found it really refreshing and especially appreciated it. Um, I remember and I don't remember what the issue was, but I especially appreciated it, Amy, when you just really opened up and and got pretty frank with everybody. In a in a really transparent sort of way about the challenges of all this. So, just kudos to 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 the leaders and all the staff. It it takes a lot of work to coordinate those, but you've done a great job. Thanks. Amy unfiltered. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would echo that. I love what we've done well. I think that was one of the reasons this was very successful. Is we went out to communities two years ago and said, you know, what worked, what didn't work with the 2050 plan, and you know, I think or the 2040 plan. So it helped us kind of lay the groundwork, and we're doing the same thing for the regional solicitation now. You know, I think we've had 30 plus yeah. listening sessions or something like that. I think I've hit about 20, so I'm, I'm doing really well. Um, but it was having that sort of framework of, you know, what what do we really need to change, and what and it has really been helpful. And I think that is really one of the strengths of the work was we sort of laid that out to start with. That's great, Rita. Yeah, I've got a question about the filtering specifically to the regional solicitation um, and the change to investment priority. Is the investment priority is that going to be filtered based on process or category, or are you talking more broadly about changing to investment priority? Yeah. So um, what we what we did was any any action that is giving direction to how we should invest, like it might say prioritize uh, regional bicycle transportation network investments. Okay. Used to be focused on the regional solicitation, but it can also inform local investment priority setting. It can inform MnDOT. So the original solicitation isn't the only funding program it should be giving direction to. So we just try to broaden that to say it's really telling the region where we should invest prior, our priority dollars. And so that's that's just one filter. And I should note, I did say this, some actions have four or five of these tags because they're actually all of them. Um, so it's not like every action has just one tag. Um, so I think the investment priorities we view as being the most important because they direct you know, what we're doing uh, in terms of investing, but the other ones are really supporting how we invest with planning and, and capacity building. Great. Uh, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And thanks for all. And congratulations to everyone involved. This is really impressive work. And my question, oh, and I was also going to note that for people who are involved who are looking for ancillary socialization, I think we take a cue from the water policy plan group. Is there an their outreach is at Celt's Pub, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is excellent turnout. We go with them. That, there we go. So the, but my question calls about one of these tags and redefining them and, and kind of how it relates to the rest of the system and maybe even relates to how we work in other divisions and departments here. But um, I was really, I found it really intriguing the shift from comprehensive planning to local planning. And you just gave a couple words about why you do that. You can then include other elements in planning that are going on in local communities, like corridor plans and things. And and I, it makes me wonder, and maybe this might be a Lisa or an Angela question as well, but is there a discussion across departments and division about how a shift like that, which is you know minor um, uh, semantic shift, but I think that's really interesting because we have such an arduous sort of process to to uh, amend our comprehensive plans, for example. And so is there a possibility that kind of taking this new approach and kind of make a, a more user-friendly version of how we how we look at the local community's plan? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I will say one thing. 
I, I don't think we're locked into that phrase. Sure. And so as we as we coordinate with the plans, you know, these last couple of months sure. to align language, we could <coughs> tweak the language to be consistent. But I do think one of the, you know one of the keys is that this is a functional plan for users, but we also produce comprehensive plan guidance directly. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think that'll just build off of this work and and we'll be more focused on just comprehensive planning, whereas this is just that broader piece. So, you know, it's, I would say, broadening it helps us be able to apply it to more things, but we'll still have things that are targeted towards how we do comp planning specifically. Okay, cool, thanks. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Interesting to see how it kind of plays out. Yeah. Any other questions? What? This is maybe a dumb question, but how on earth are we expected to actually change people's vehicle miles travel that drastically? Yeah, that's sort of the uh, question of the day at MnDOT, too. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways, VMT target is maybe a little bit more aspirational, like a Vision Zero target. Um, it's saying that we, we, we want to do this, it helps us achieve a lot of our goals, and, it, and if we can make progress towards it, that's good. And so there's, we have a lot of strategies or actions in the TPP about that, you know, things like investing in more bike pad and transit infrastructure, um, doing incentives through TDM programming. So we do have ways to do it. Um, we also have to partner with the land use side to, to address that as well. There hasn't been a projection that's shown we're going to get there um, yet, and so I do think it's a little bit aspirational. Um, but it is it is one of our one of the things that MnDOT spent a, a solid year engaging the state on when they when they set that target, and they heard some of those similar questions. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with Cole. It's, it's somewhat aspirational. It's also, you know, it's kind of the framework that we have now. We're going to have a similar thing when it comes to the greenhouse gases um, and how that works. And I think the thing is, us as, as council need to look at as we look at the region is some of the, the outer areas of even greater Minnesota is going to look to the more urban core of the entire state to figure out how to do the VMT and the greenhouse gases and we've got to figure out how to spread that wealth amongst lots of different communities and figure out how we're going to talk about it how we're going to present it because um, you know you get in you know, you've all heard my Norway in America example of not having a grocery. You've got to drive 10 miles to go to a grocery. There's no way you can change that 10 miles. It's always 10 miles, and, you know, you can't reduce that. You know, but, you know, so we're looking at partnering with the county to see if we can do some sort of shuttle service, you know, a couple times a week for for um, people who have a hard time driving, you know, things like that. So there are some ways, but it's one, figuring out what they are, making sure all communities are doing something, but then also taking credit for stuff that maybe they are doing, but not taking credit for them. So, yeah, Judy. So the goal encompasses, of course, the goal specifically is about greenhouse gas emission. Or is it to just, because I'm just guessing by 2050, there's electric vehicles all over the place. And maybe not for, you know, depending on freight, I don't, you know, I don't know what kind of engines and things will be out there. You know, we're certainly trying to electrify the grid and all that, but, you know, there's other ways to, I mean, that's, that's where I'm going. You know, if everybody, I'm just waiting for the electric cars on the grid and I'm there and it'll happen, I think, before 2050, that I think that's going to be the new norm. So, does does that partner, you know, in the goal? Even though vehicle miles traveled might not get to the goal, if if we can, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think the way we've talked about it is, it's got to be both. They're complementary. Um, there are some implications to driving, even if even if it's an electric vehicle. You know, there's still a lot of safety concerns and other concerns that. that Reducing VMT gets us to other outcomes, like reducing fatalities, deaths, wear and tear on the road. There's still pollution from electric vehicles, the brake dust, stuff like that. So we have complementary strategies. And also to Councilmember Wolf's, or sorry, to Councilmember Barber's point, these strategies can be more uh, aggressively approached in different parts of the region, depending on their underlying circumstances. Electric vehicles might work a lot better for rural and exurban areas than trying to do VMT reduction. 
a VMT reduction might work better for areas that have those other modes and readily accessible. So we didn't want to highlight one as being more important than the other. They're both important goals, and we're going to, we're going to seek them in parallel um, with each other. In a lot of ways, VMT reduction is more of a near-term opportunity. We don't have to wait for technology to catch up. Um, and I should mention, I forgot to mention this, we, we actually did a study called Maximum VMT Mode Shift, and we looked at the actual observed travel data of residents in the region and which trips could reasonably shift to another mode. You know, if they're less than a half mile and someone drove or they're less than a mile and someone drove, they could have biked. And we looked at, with some, some moderate improvements in infrastructure, we could actually reduce 15% of the region's VMT if we were able to make it attractive enough for those people to choose another mode. So the, the opportunity is out there. It takes some strategic investment, and that's why we have that objective in the TPP. Um, and it really points to, I would say it's not just about climate change mitigation, it's about a lot of things, the VMT one in particular. Mr. Chair, I do appreciate the whole thing. And I, I think what's very interesting too is generational changes on how many kids people are having and what longevity and how we're cohabitating. And that's why I'm just one that believes that we should quit saying single family Households or you know single family zoning because households are arranging and however they want you know arranged. But it'll be fascinating to watch. And I love my car. I because um, I have four kids, two dogs, a goldfish, and a hamster, and you know just that won't haul on a bike for me. But that the the idea is to not get everybody out of their vehicle, but for those right. who can and want to, yes. But I just love. I wanted to see where technology also goes in this, and hoping that you know and it, we can. And we'll yeah, just to, like that is one of the things MnDOT is working on is is, and I think we're partnering with them is to tell those stories about what does VMT reduction mean <coughs> in different lifestyles today, and using real world examples yeah. of you know maybe instead of taking two trips to the grocery store a week because you forgot something, maybe you just take one and you, you eat yeah. something different that night. You know, so there's little things you can do yeah. uh, potentially to change your behavior that aren't that aren't going to change the way you live your life. Thanks, Cole. Let, less committee meetings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the mini meeting where Judy explains how she transports that goldfish. I'm telling you, on the way to the cabin, you gently put it in the front seat of the car because that thing's not going to make it until you come back two weeks later. So it was, it was a thing. And my husband drove separately because why would you want to ride in that mess? So, so we were really violating the boat. Vehicle miles uh, very, very simply. I mean, a, a good example of how you address something in a simple way is, is by trip chaining. You know, like today, you know, yeah. at, we joked that I made several stops on my way. I stopped at, you know, mm -hmm. the business clients to do stuff and met someone else, you know, for a business meeting downtown here, came to council, did this and that. So, something that could have been three or four different trips pretty easily is one trip. Mm -hmm. And it's, and you look at that, and that those are individual ways that you can very significantly reduce VMT. And it's just, honestly, it makes it more convenient. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is likely generational. Sue, did you mm -hmm. I was just wanting to know more about right. goldfish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally understand that. I do trip chaining mm -hmm. all the time. But it, to me, some of the things that you're driving for are quality of life things like I can go to the park by my house on foot or on the bike or whatever all the time but I might want to go to Baker Park Reserve or you know that those are vehicle miles traveled I can walk to restaurants quite a few from my house but I want to try restaurants around the region and some of that if we cut down too hard you know tell everybody don't drive Okay, how's Kings in Meesville going to do if nobody drives there because it's a town of less than 200 people? So, you know, I, I they're, people they're, still they're, drive to Kings. Well, but let's then let's be honest about it that maybe that's not always the goal to have people not drive. All right, Brian. Right. Mr. Chair, I'll just one tie up point that ties a little bit to this conversation, but goes broadly to a lot of our conversation too. I mean. You can use vehicle miles traveled in many ways, though, for overall affordability across the region and cost of living. Um, as the cost of a vehicle, in some cases, surpasses household average income in parts of our region, it's important to recognize that in many cases, like the areas that end up being most affordable are the ones in which auto dependence is less because it means there are other ways to get around. 
which doesn't necessarily negate the ability to take trips and do other things that matter a great deal. But for cost burden households, for households that are struggling with housing affordability, some of the costs other council members mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a proxy measure in many ways that can be really important. And when you look at a lot of measures of housing plus transportation, focusing on the T helps on the H, focusing on the H can help the T. And so I would just say from a more holistic perspective, how we try to keep both in our minds moving forward matters a great deal. And really kind of puts a bow on a lot of what you've been able to talk about. Which is why our robust transit uh, oriented development and some of the development we're seeing along corridors is really pretty robust, and that's going to make a difference. For yeah, and, and I think that's a great point, because you don't even necessarily have to change behavior if you just change where people live mm -hmm. and where they need to go. You know, if we just get more dense in areas that are close to up destinations, VMT will come down naturally. In fact, it's been fairly flat per capita for the last decade as a result of the region densifying uh, in the urban core more. So there are some ways to get at it without even asking folks to change their behavior. All right, we have 60 seconds left. I got Lisa wow, to come up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Carroll. I'll try to talk really fast. This is a slide that I'm not going to go over with you, but it's You're a not read quite a slide, Lisa. We got it this morning. And it's, it's a great color slide. But what, we, said he what I do want to share is that there is a lot of official activity that um, advisory committees and standing committees of the council will need to be taking over these next three months to get to that release of the public comment draft. And that we are coordinating as staff across all of our work behind the scenes so that we can all get to that August 14th council action to release Imagine 2050 for official public comment. And that initiates our public comment process. We'll have a shared uh, public hearing in September only official things. There are all sorts of other things and activities and work that will be happening and other meetings that will be happening along the way. Additional engagement, as you've heard, <clears throat> continued engagement and coordination with MINDA on our emissions targets for transportation, continued work with the American Indian Advisory Council that we'll see coming to us um, during our public comment periods too, that we will be bringing those conversations to you for um, shaping up that final draft that will be in front of the council um, for adoption in February of next year. So what we don't have on this slide is what happens after the close of the public comment period because it doesn't fit on the slide, but because we have a lot to get to this next point. And then you'll see a similar process um, getting us to that um, official adoption date as well because we bring those public comment reports back to the committees and get their review of recommendation and bring them back through this process to get you to February. Um, so there'll be informal conversations before we have official um, actions that move through each of the committees, very similar to how the council uh, reviews and approves and adopts your unified uh, budget each year too is a similar process to what we're adopt, uh, using here for this um, Imagine 2050. So we've talked a lot about questions today, so I'm gonna say we're out of time for discussion, but if there are other things that you'd like us to address and um, are other issues that you'd like to um, connect with staff on, please feel free to reach out to them. Um, we are always taking comments. We really appreciate all your thoughts today. Thank you. Thanks. Sure, Robert, just one quick comment. This is back to slide five when I was talking about technical assistance and planning resources. Mm -hmm. And we've talked quite a bit about how we can better support smaller communities mm -hmm. throughout the region, maybe even do a lot of yes. the work for them. So is that a budget conversation? And is staffing. Yep. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Lilligren, you're actually previewing our budget conversation at CDC oh, next sorry, week, so sorry. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, to, uh, absolutely, um, how much funding the council wants to set aside for things like our planning assistance fund that we have provided and are um, directed and enabled in statute to provide for local, to facilitate local conference planning, as well as um, what it would take to resource providing that direct assistance to local governments okay. to actually do their plans. Those are all budget conversations, and we will be teeing those up in our budget conversation Thank this year. Thanks, Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, stay tuned. Wonderful. Lisa, thank you. Thank you for your entire group. Oh, staff, everybody who presented today. Um, huge summer.
big year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this meeting is adjourned, but the conversation will